Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may happen to be, and whether you're watching live or archived, and welcome to another in Not Lost Transmission Talk Tuesday series. This is, if you're keeping score at home, number 19 out of the series. We've uh, given up keeping track on me getting it right. I think it's finally sunk in. Old dog can learn new tricks if you beat him over the head with them long enough. This is going to be kind of a fun one. We're talking about uh, stuff that went boom. and uh, the uh, voider of warranties and blower up of stuff extraordinaire. My good friend, Alex Hartman is with me today. Alex, welcome and thanks for coming along. No problem, Jeff, this is the fun part. So for anybody that doesn't know, Alex and I have known each other probably 10, well, today according to Facebook is our 10 year friend anyway. Anyway, um, right. we, we've known each other a lot of years uh, before he was a customer, before he was an Autel employee. And uh, Alex is the guy that when you look at a piece of equipment and it's got a little sticker over a screw hold and says warranty void if altered or damaged, he's the one they put that there for. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to have some fun with that. Uh, we've got the standard housekeeping stuff. Uh, if you're new to one of these webinars, then you've got the uh, ability to ask questions by text or verbally. You can uh, type it into a little question box in your control interface. When you hit enter, I'll see it over here. I see a whole lot of comments already coming in. We'll reference those in a second. And uh, you've also got the ability, if you've got a microphone and feel like jumping into the conversation, hit the little hand raise an icon and we'll happily unmute you and uh, make you part of the day. This is uh, qualifying for a recertification credit with the SBE under category I. If you're an SBE member and have certification and check out the shiny new SBE website, by the way, I've uh, mentioned that the last couple of webinars, but it's been a few weeks and it's still really impressive. So uh, definitely if you are an SBE member and you've got a certification, then uh, put this in the little uh, spreadsheet on the SBE website that you're using to keep track for research. If you're an SBE member and you don't have certification, why not? Go get it. All right, that's my ad for the SBE. Wayne Piscina, our president's in here. Wayne, you can uh, buy me a beer next time you see me. And I know that was somehow directed at me. Somehow. <laughs> no comment, but uh, if the shoe fits, lace it up. All right, so one other thing before we get uh, rolling too far, the standard question and answer. The first question we have, the person that I never introduce on the cover page, our disembodied voice and uh, master of all things webinar oriented, Ed uh, Sylvester is the marketing guru that makes all this stuff work. And uh, for those who are new to us, Ed uses a uh, different image for his uh, little title on our title page every day. It's the only rule is that it can't be Ed. So the first person to answer who it is, is uh, the winner of some swag kit, whatever that may be. Ed gets to pick the swag kit too. So I guess it really depends how much you impress him. Um, and this week, Marco Aridi wins. So Marco, congratulations. Uh, it'll be reaching out and uh, figuring out where to send that. I'm pretty sure we know where to find you anyway. Um, all righty. Uh, by the way, if anybody's ever talked to uh, Brendan Tipney over in customer service, his uh, boss says that that uh, photo uh, looked a lot like him. So just for what it's worth. Um, anyway, that's uh, Spicoli from Fast Times at Ridgemont High was Ed's picture today. Uh, we'll skip over the agenda. This is the same slide we've used for the last 19 slideshow or 19 presentations. I guess the previous 18, 18. this will be number 19. Yeah, see, you're keeping score at home. So what are we going to talk about? Stuff that went boom. And we're going to try and do this from an educational perspective because flat out, we all blow stuff up. Um, some of us better than others. Um, and, and the goal is not to stop us from blowing stuff up, but to try to learn stuff in the process. And that is sometimes the biggest challenge. So that is what we're going to look at. Uh, we're going to look at what we blew up, how it blew up, why it blew up, and uh, how we make it not blow up the next time. Uh, anybody who's heard me talk knows that boom is one of my favorite words. We're going to see how many times we can use it today. I may throw a prize kit to anybody who's running a ticker and uh, keeps track of how many times that is. All right. 
So this one came from Sean Mattingly with Wolf Boom in Muncie, Illinois. And uh, Sean is uh, a frequent attendee to these. I haven't looked to see if he's here yet today, but let me just oh, saw yep, his Sean name is here. So Sean, number one, massive kudos for the, the humor. I mean, the uh, I, I had to put the picture in exactly as you sent it because uh, that was priceless. So. Uh, do you want to tell me a story about this a little bit? That looks like a, is that a lighting choke? It looks like a, it's a wound wire, is it? Yeah, that comes from my 1000 watt AM station in a Harris uh, ATU vintage piece of equipment, which is now no longer used. But uh, I like to entertain my friends on Facebook and fellow engineers. So I, I just set the three uh, items side by side on my kitchen counter one morning. I was like, this is a choke from an ATU. This is a choke that's toast. This is bread that is toast. <laughs> got a bunch uh, of laughs. I, got, I was going to say you. Uh, I, I I I was going to say your wife must be much more understanding than mine because mine would uh, have a little bit of a hemorrhage if I put a burnt component on the counter. But uh, then I remember the Tardis story, and we'll uh, we'll have to share that again. <laughs> <laughs> I was just amazed at how the lightning right damage there. choke didn't look as much like a choke. <laughs> that, Back when I had to right. go find a, a part out of my parts bin, I didn't know exactly what I was looking for. I didn't know what it started out looking like. Now, and, and so next question, I, I mean, obviously, you know, stat, or drain chokes are really meant to uh, to take the uh, the surge as kind of their purpose to bleed it off the ground. Uh, what do you do in a situation like that to try and prevent it from happening again? Or do you just chalk it off as a one off and keep going? In my installation, I think that sort of thing had happened in other cases, too, because there was some add on uh, gas tube component in association with that. And uh, mm -hmm. actually, I replaced that part and adjusted my uh, spark gap a little bit, and uh, I never had the problem again until, well, that tower was replaced later on. Right, right. And th that is one really good point. Uh, if you don't have ball gaps of some sort or static discharge or a spark gap in your ATU, then that's certainly something you could add to protect from this from happening again. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of blown static drain choke pictures, but none that are really this artistic. Sean, I'm going to get you to stay on because you sent me a few pictures and I used all of them. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, they, they were all pretty awesome and educational. Uh, this is yeah. a, a FM filter that uh, looks like something tried to get out uh, and may or may not have succeeded. Uh, so what was the situation there? I'm assuming it was a lightning strike as well. Yeah, we're fortunate or unfortunate enough to have the tallest tower in the whole city. So lightning finds us every couple of years, probably every two years. And uh, on this one, you know, there was a hot spot there. It was glowing orange when I found it. And it led me to wonder whether RF was trying to get out of my transmitter or uh, lightning tried to get in. Um, that site actually ended up destroying a couple of these uh, filters mm. before we uh, hired a consultant to come in and install a custom-made shorting stub in my antenna line, which tells the lightning don't come all the way in. Yeah, right. and that is one of the things that I've run into on occasion. And in, in our case, uh, one of our transmitter models, uh, if it's connected to a specific antenna, which has a shorting stub in it, and the right length of coax, then then you can see that. And and yeah, quarter wave stub in a case like that is a is an excellent solution. The so, ounce of prevention factor. Yes. And uh, Alex, by the way, uh, Elaine mentions that she that picture came up. She saw you cringe. I've seen the the <laughs> the glowing orange low pass filters and, and unweldings of fittings just the same. Not necessarily out of the side, usually out of the ends. But uh... now, now, Sean, I know you're into cars too, and uh, there was a picture on Facebook not too long ago. I saw it was a picture of a uh, a wheel bearing that was glowing, and the, the caption was, "I wonder what this alarm light means." <laughs> <laughs> Now, last one. Whoops, skip past it. Got a little carried away there. That is, that's almost a whole different version of hollow state technology, solid state conversion. <laughs> yeah, in that case, we had a, uh, uh, what was it? A uh, high line box, uh, the, something with a, a POTS phone interface plugged in the back of it. And I noticed the uh, 
after a particularly bad strike, my unit was rebooting about every 14 seconds on its own. And the screen was uh, kind of dim and flashing and I pulled out the POTS module and what do you know, the unit quit rebooting on its own. A uh, closer inspection revealed the top was blown clear off this uh, IC chip size module. And uh, it's the first one I've ever seen that really had a, a neat little coil encased in it. Yeah, as I, opposed I know, to I've never seen a toroid hiding in silicon. Yeah, you yeah, never know what's in there until you let the yeah let the smoke out. Well, once yeah. you blow the epoxy off, all becomes clear. Sometimes in That's pieces, true. but but that that is really neat. Well, Sean, thank you very much for those photos because that uh, the, those are really good examples. And this is one of those situations where you know you might uh, throw some ferrite on the uh, phone wire coming in. Um, obviously, checking the grounding at the D mark, but uh, but yeah, it's really interesting when stuff like that lets go. Yes, since that particular strike, we invested in some uh, ferrite kits from, uh, I believe I got them from Tesco, and you can get mm -hmm. them from other places, but I buy uh, the smaller ferrites in three or four sizes, and I put those on as many incoming and outgoing wires as I can. Yeah, now somebody had made a really good comment on, uh, I think it was on one of the Facebook engineering groups that I follow the other day about, uh, they had a situation where their their um, copper lines were really, really prone to blowing out the front end of their uh, their internet system. And what they ended up doing was putting an air gap in in the form of fiber uh, because, you know, uh, lightning surge doesn't travel over glass nearly as well as it travels over copper. So, okay. Sean, thanks very much. I appreciate that one more time. You're welcome. All right, moving forward. <laughs> I think this might be one of yours, Alex. Yes, and it is. That's uh, that, that coil is probably not going to be all that variable anymore. No, it's definitely in a fixed form now um, and in the wrong setting, of course. Uh, you know, it, it's it's this is what happens if you don't check your connections too uh you know the, this is one of those things that you get the phone call at two in the morning it, it's turning off on its own and it sounds really bad and you go out and you just open the door and you can smell the problem right away and and uh you know it's one of those days you know you're just going to be there for a while <laughs> yeah well ray lewis brings up a good question sort of jumping back to the um the yeah. slide about uh, Sean's filter, uh, question about gas discharge versus quarter wave shorting stub. And, and that's a good point. Um, I like the stub because it's a hard wired DC path to ground. Mm -hmm. um, whereas a gas discharge, you do have to have the surge hit the, the breakdown voltage. Now, having said that, the, the shorting stub is, is typically tuned for the, uh, the second harmonic and it's a short circuit at carrier frequency and below. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, depending on what you're trying to protect from, the gas discharge would probably do it, but it definitely, especially at the higher voltages or higher power levels, it's hard to get a gas discharge that'll go into a three and an eighth inch line. Polyphaser used to make them, I don't think they do anymore. Yeah, the, I, I don't see them bigger than the seven ace anymore for those. It's just not yeah. economical anymore. Yeah, and I know the gas discharge tubes we used in our one kilowatts. I mean, our cost on them was like eight hundred bucks, so uh, they're they're not uh, they're not inexpensive. Definitely, the yeah. the shorting stub. And little plug here: if you go to our website under the support tab on the right, there's technical resources. And in there, there's a tips and tricks link. And if you click that, you'll get all my tips and tricks articles. And there is an article about building your own quarter wave shorting stub. And I mean, it's geared more for coax, but whether you're using coax or hardline, the, the physics don't change. Just whether you cut it with a hacksaw or a pair of uh, side cutters. Let's see, uh, Rich Hahn says that a gas tube may be stressed, failed, and not necessarily detectable. If the quarter wave uh, stub fails, you're almost certainly going to know. And That's that, true. <laughs> that is true. When a quarter that wave is very stub true. Fails, there, there's usually glowing bits involved. So mm -hmm. thanks very much for that, Rich. That, that's valid information. Um, burnt phenolic has an odor. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's a very, very memorable order. If you throw it in with the ozone of fried electronics, uh, it's uh, definitely a good thing. So what's the story with this one? 
uh, the company that no longer makes phasers made this coil and get a call saying, hey, I just need an extra set of hands to remove it. We get on site and we find this. And I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> That's like a, it goes into a 50 kilowatt daytime ATU. And that was the reactance coil specifically. Uh, so it, it, it's got a lot of juice going through it. And again, the tight connection factor of, you know, that the ounce of prevention is definitely a thing. You know, grab the thermal imaging camera, the FLIR like uh, Jeff is popular for having on attached to his phone or the, the little fluke ones you can buy or any of those sorts. Um, AM specifically, I mean, especially with copper being malleable and moving and, you know, here in Minnesota specifically, right now it is 21 degrees Fahrenheit. I woke up this morning at 13, which means everything's going to expand and contract, which means those connections are going to start getting loose. And when you see heat, that's a loose connection usually. So make sure this time of year is the time to go check. Make sure that everything's yep. tight so you don't end up in this situation where that coil was a $10,000 oops. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's uh, get a comment here from scrolling down, John Van Milligan, that he uh, had a situation where he had some screen supply caps that uh, failed until he found the transformer tap set wrong and the voltage was way high. Mm -hmm. And uh, Definitely that sort of thing can happen on, uh, on, you know, it's like, like we've said before, anybody can make a mistake. I mean, we all do. It's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, but typically we try to avoid making the same mistake twice. I tell people, I said, don't make the same mistake twice. There's so many new ones waiting to be made. Exactly. Um, John, I am going to let, let me know if you've got a, uh, if you've got a mic available, I've unmuted you. And uh, do you want to tell us a story about this one? And you're unmuted, but we're not hearing you. So we will move on. And uh, if you are able to yell at me, then uh, just interrupt me and we'll uh, bring you in for that. Yep. Breaker panel there, Mark, had mentions. You know, always check those. Mm -hmm. Those, those so will have a really bad day. So I had a situation once where a guy called me, one of our there, old... There's my phone sound. There oh, there's John. Okay, so tell me the story about the screen supply cap. Well, uh, we kept on... This is a transmitter. It had automatic uh, power control, so it would automatically raise up the screen supply. And as the tube got older, I would blow, it, blow caps. So I'd replace them and then go back again and the same thing happened and I looked at the cap size and measured the voltage one time it says this is too high <laughs> then I started discovering that that transmitter didn't originally live there it was somewhere else so I started checking you know supply the transformer taps were set wrong for the voltage there so I was pushing the tube a lot longer than I it was should have with the higher mm -hmm. screen voltage and um, discovered other things in that transmitter that were set wrong too and uh, got it working a lot better. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, assuming that it was not there, I started checking all the things that you should do in the installation list. Right. And, and depending on the, uh, on the, the tube configuration, I mean, whether it's screen voltage or filament voltage, uh, but bringing that down, you're really going to tend to extend the life of the tube a whole bunch too. Right. Yeah. And and that's a really good point though, because a lot of times folks will end up picking a used box up from somewhere and, you know, it's configured for 200 volts. So they plug it into 200 volts, not realizing that depending on whether you're Y or Delta, that could be 208 to 240. And then do, with local, uh, you know, variances, it could be even more than that. So, so that's a, a really, really good point, John. If you do pick up a used yeah. box, you should go through the full install notes. And, yeah, and to a... double check, usually those used boxes don't come with a history. You know, you don't know who's been in there and done what to them. Yeah. I had a transformer, I mean, going indirect method, looking on the chart in the book, uh, plate voltage and current and what power and it was off the chart and i talked to the uh transmitter people and they say um is the tube in one piece <laughs> and he says yes he says change that tap on the transformer so that was another one it was that i mean it's like 
a thousand volts higher than the tube was rated for. <laughs> so. That's a bunch. Yep, yep. Yeah. Well, excellent. Thank Matt you for that, low. John. That, that was uh, useful information. Yeah. Any uh, text here about if you're interested about having a shorting stub made for your frequency, um, give uh, Fred Francis over at Xenirad, and that's uh, xenirad.com. Um, if you go back to the archives of our Waves newsletters, and I think you can find that either under resources or media, I'm not positive, somewhere on our website, just uh, search for Waves on the search window. Um, I did do an article about shorting stubs not too, re not too long ago, and, uh, and Fred got a mention in there, so you can find his contact information in there as well. Um, Mark Forrest makes a good point that uh, loose connections in a breaker panel are uh, very bad because he almost had a fire. And this is why I keep this thing. Alex had mentioned it earlier and I'm gonna show it off because I can, but uh, it's like show and tell, right? Uh, but yeah, oh, yeah, these little, uh, and I mean, I use the FLIR. There, I get it a little closer. The camera says, yeah, I'm not trying to focus on that, but it's just a little thing that plugs into the phone. It gives you infrared camera capabilities on your phone. You can get them for Android or iOS. Uh, say I use a FLIR, F-L-I-R, but there are other ones available. They all uh, they all work pretty well, and uh, it's a really good point to get in the habit at least once every couple of months. Just take a snapshot with thermal image of the breaker panel, and if you see a hot spot, there's something you might want to uh, pay attention to. Yep. Uh, and don't forget the dog houses out in the field if you got an AM. The parts exactly. that no one ever looks at. Well, yeah, and that comes back to your the the picture previous to this with the uh, rocker, the roller coil. I mean, those little rollers yeah. can oxidize, and uh, if you don't hit them with Nolox or uh, cleaner on a fairly, I say fairly regular, it doesn't have to be monthly, but it'll do it'll vary or depending. Even just on exercise them. You can get flat spots just as easily. Yep. Again, yeah. copper is malleable. It will change over time with just a little bit of pressure. I mean, it, it's the Chinese water torture thing. You know, it's doing this. If it's yep, sitting yep. there for 30 years like that, it's going to get a little bit of a gap between it. Mm -hmm. Yep, so definitely um, check them out every now and again. Uh, speaking of smelling stuff, this is one that uh, I got from a good friend Gary Cavell with Cavell and Mertz down in uh, D.C. I don't think Gary's on. I just told him he was going to be a guest star, unofficial guest star, if you will, earlier today. But uh, this particular situation, this is the uh, power supply distribution for one of our AM boxes. You can see the transformer in the lower right, so we're not dealing with something with switching supplies. This has got a big honking transformer in it. And what they found, and they just found this out this week after, so it blew up a couple of times. And after the, you know, the first time you replace it, the second time you say, why is it blowing up more than once? The third time you really start to wonder and start to dig. And so they did a lot of dig and they started digging into the history of the place and discovered that the solid state tr transmitter before it had power supply issues, which was why it got replaced. But then they found out the tube transmitter before that had blown up several times. And mm -hmm. at that point you start to say, maybe we should get an electrician in here. And they did and what they found was an issue with a, uh, ground to neutral connection and the fact that the so the ground was bonded to neutral which is pretty much the way it's supposed to be but then the ground itself didn't go anywhere in the facility it was relying totally on neutral wiring and that can be kind of mm -hmm. sketchy uh, so they've got uh, they've got some work to do there for sure oh yeah um, definitely it's uh you know, there, there are a whole lot of things to uh, deal with there. Let's see. Going to see if I can. I got to stretch things out enough to read this comment because I see the words Amfet 50. <laughs> oh, this is Dave. Dave Yule. Hey, Dave. Um, Dave, do you have a microphone? Because if you do, I'm going to unmute you and let me tell you the story. Um, let's see. So if you unmute yourself, then you should be able to. Let's see, now Elaine's cringing. Oh, no mic. Okay, so I'll read the story because this is an Amphet 50 story. Got an alarm one day, the site had switched to standby. Got to the site, he could smell burnt electronics. That's what we said. Yeah, there's, once you, uh, it, it's the fastest way to troubleshoot anything. You open the door and go, uh-oh. Two but, cans uh, salmon. 
<laughs> yep, follow your nose. It always knows. After mm -hmm. searching the transmitter, opened up the output cabinet, found a mica cap. Yeah, those cast mica caps. Now, for what it's worth, those uh, Sangamo cast mica caps, I, received, uh, I forget who makes them now, but uh, uh, Cornell de Bellier, I think. But uh, the, those big black mica caps, they emit this really thick yellow smoke when they're in the process of letting go big time. And I called Sangamo on it once back in the service days, and they assure me that smoke is non-toxic. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's that's, that's uh, anyway, reassuring. Yeah, Mica Cap had blown up. Fortunately, had a spare, cleaned up the cabinet, put the transmitter on air. A couple of months later, the same thing happened. Getting the rig back on air, found the 72 volts was down to about 69. The uh, site's at the end of an industrial power grid. And the 72 volts went down far enough to cause spurs. The output filter overheated, handling trying to handle the extra spurs. Retap the transformer to give about 74 volts. So it, it's amazing how a power supply rail going off its ideal can cause interesting things. And like in John's case with the uh, with, with the caps failing, in this case with the micas, in an RF section, you wouldn't even think of tying power supply to this. So definitely, right. yeah, some, sometimes the investigation is uh, is the bigger challenge. Uh, Chris Hayes is sending me one in an email. Thanks, Chris. Um, now, Chris, I know you've got a microphone. So rather than doing that, we're just going to pull the mute button. And there we go. So, Chris, if you want to unmute yourself and tell me the story you sent me the email about, uh, I don't have email on right now, but I'd be happy to hear it. Oh, hello. Okay. Hey, how are you doing now? Well, what I sent <laughs> you was a uh, picture of a center conductor of a former 3 and an H line that used to go from KLOS's transmitter up about a 300 foot tower on Mount Wilson. This fault just started with a few transmitter kickoffs, went to the hill and said, Norm, my boss Norm, uh, kicked up on us, kicked off on SWR. I said, oh, that's weird. And in a couple of weeks it did it again. And then, then the trips got closer and closer together over time. So finally it just said, okay, I'm done. I'm not looking at this thing anymore. So uh, aux antenna at a time, but that's that's what it was. Somewhere I got a picture of a, a right angle similarly damaged. It was in the same general area in the feed line. But uh, I just realized I'm gesturing at you, and you can't see me, so I don't know. <laughs> we all talk with our hands. Yeah, and I've run into one like that. I had a transmitter in Seattle where the customer called. It was tripping on SWR, and uh, he. Uh, gave me he uh, reached out to us he goes yeah he goes i think something's wrong with this new transmitter and i said why is that and he goes because there's a little pile of black soot under the filter <laughs> yeah little piles of black soot are almost never a good thing so we get out there and uh take a look and it's like sure enough i open the, the tear, take the filter out and totally tear it apart which is its own special uh, brand of entertainment and uh, get it apart, and there's some, uh, we use Teflon insulators in there to make capacitors in an FM filter. And uh, one of the sheets of Teflon had, had arced through and burned up pretty nicely. Hmm. So it's like, yeah, we get a new, well, I call engineering, and they take a look, and they say, yeah, that probably could be a little thicker. So they did a fast redesign and got me a new filter overnight. And uh, next morning, we pick it up, we go to throw it in, and uh, the, uh, the filters in maybe wasn't in very long at all we start to run it up and it trips on swr well my mama didn't raise too many fools this one <laughs> and uh so i said i shut it down i bring the power down figured out where it arced and dropped it well below that and said uh we need to uh we need to take a look and i started thinking which is always dangerous and i grabbed the tape measure calculated out a half wavelength, started at the point where the filter arced, calculated to the output filter, and then just grabbed the tape measure and went like this all the way down the line and ended up at a half wavelength being exactly on the input port of the branch combiner. Mm. So we, 
we shut the station down, we pulled the three and an eighth inch flange, and when I knocked the flange off of the input to the branch combiner, a big pile of soot fell out. Um, turns out that the 30 watt rated branch combiner input wasn't doing really well with 22 kilowatts or 30 kilowatts. So uh, yeah, that that was a uh, combiner manufacturer flew out and did a quick redesign and a quick rebuild and everything got good. But uh, sometimes just the, the problem you see is the symptom, not the problem. And definitely if it happens twice, you need to be looking for a different cause. Now, moving on, I'm going to drag the question. I had it all expanded to read uh, Dave's uh, comment there. <laughs> This one was another really interesting one. Uh, when the conduit, when when the AC line gets hit hard enough to blow a hole in the conduit that it's running through, that's when you know you need to reassess your grounding just a little bit. Yeah. Um, this this was a site I was at uh, not too long ago. Uh, I want to say shortly before I got grounded. So uh, definitely, um, you know, if you blow a hole in your conduit, you really, really, really need to be uh, looking at other uh, other things in your uh, facility. Yeah, and that just I've doesn't run, happen. <laughs> yeah, I ran into a situation once where they'd had something like that. Like what, I think it was a conduit in that case too. Like it, it hadn't blown a hole right in it, but there was an obvious blue spot on it. Mm -hmm. And they said, yeah, yeah, cable burned up inside. We, and I said, well, what'd you do? Well, we pulled new cable and hooked it up again. When did this happen? Oh, a couple of weeks ago. It's like, um, what caused it? Well, I don't know. So, yeah, yeah, no, we, sometimes you need to do a little more research. Now, I think I've got another one of yours, speaking of uh, things that don't necessarily connect all that well. Right. Well, I mean, and again, this goes back to the maintenance factor of, you know, barred air conditioner on a shelter. And it, no one thinks to look at, you know, the electrical wiring going into the compressor and stuff like that. I certainly didn't till it stops working and it just happens you know the, the 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 compressor itself is failing and it's 25 years old and poorly maintained and this is what the end result is is it just overworks and shorts itself out you know, again follow your nose factor the only way you knew there was a problem is it smelled like electrical burning coming out of an air conditioner yeah that's no, not a normal smell for what it's worth, and, and it's not unique to these, uh, uh, sort of a two-part story, the uh, Superflex, uh, it's a 156-strand basically welding cable that we used in our old transmitters. I think we still use it a lot. But uh, that stuff, if it sits and is in a warm place with a lot of current through it, so the cable runs warm anyway, for 10, 15, 20 years, then the insulation gets pretty brittle. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw this once too with a uh, Continental 317 that we were moving as part of a transmitter install. We moved the Continental six feet across the floor. And when the moving guys set it down, practically all of the insulation on all the wires fell into the bottom of the cabinet. Mm -hmm. So I've had uh, that happen on RF cables just the same. And, you know, old mm -hmm. uh, FM series uh, Harris rigs that are pushing now 30, 35 years old. They've right. been sitting there having that squirrel cage blower blow across them for the past 30 years. Mm -hmm. It's going to dry. I don't care how much you, the, the mom's biscuits, it doesn't matter. You blow that much air that long, it's going to dry out. Yeah. You know, you, so, you just grab the insulation, the whole thing just crumbles in your hand. Well, so you remember that. You can see uh, this was a design cable. flaw. But <laughs> but, yeah. And I mean, this, yeah, the wires being tight around, that's an install flaw more than anything. But uh, right. Yeah, you don't run a wire right over a hard lug like that. But uh, yeah, I mean, you had the same case in, uh, was it an FM25 where you um, put a uh, solid state uh, transmitter in for the uh, to replace the IPA and the coax yep. kind of crumbled on you? Yep, exactly and, that. Yep, and I mean, that stuff can happen. doesn't matter who you are. It's just this cable gets older, the insulation gets brittle. So definitely if you have to move something or if you've got intermittence it's a great cause of intermittence uh, i ran into a situation where wires in a bundle uh every time the transmitter came on and the main contactor pulled in it was vibrating them enough to sometimes short them so you know it, it uh it can be some really interesting challenges that way yeah and and there's no no shortage of that everywhere you know again the the, the things that can go boom like these are easily preventable 
but not top of mind. You know, well, like I said, not many people open the side of a BARD and open up the electrical access hatch on the compressor just to see how the wire is doing. And, you know, that's, right. that's something you do when something's wrong with it. You know, mm -hmm. but, but those types of things, again, the, the, the FLIR camera, could that have caught that? Maybe, maybe not. You know, that looked like it was hard and fast in this particular instance, but, you know, the, right. the, 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 the conduit and stuff, I've been to plenty of sites where you walk into the building and the EMT is various colors of the rainbow because of how hot it's gotten in various places. Mm -hmm. You know, like you said, that's a symptom of something bigger problem. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of the, the big thing. I mean, you know, you use your senses as much as you can feel stuff to see if it's warm, do a visual to, uh, you know, look for the things that are discolored or, you know, a pile of soot in a place that there shouldn't be a pile of soot, which right. is pretty much anywhere in a transmission facility. Right. Uh, I have one site that they, it's a, uh, it was a brand new, really nice installation, prefab building, 20 kilowatt transmitter. And the, the day the guy calls me and says, hey, can you come take a look at this place? I walk open and open the door. There's chicken wire everywhere. Mm hmm. And I'm like, why is there chicken wire hanging on the walls of a brand new building? Well, it turns out they're hanging the uh, isocoupler on the hot AM the FM was going to 50 feet in the air on the tower. Ah. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Things that won't work. <laughs> they were Not wondering the why they kept blowing modules in the FM. And the, the way that but, the, the previous guy knew how to fix it was to try and make a Faraday cage. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think that's uh, probably the biggest takeaway from this is, uh, you know, things will blow up on occasion, whether it's a manufacturing defect, whether it's infant mortality on a part, which can typically, I, I know um, our service manager was on earlier, not sure if he still is, he's going to start cringing now as his ears start to burn. But as a rule, most infant mortality will happen in the first 90 days, give or take. Yep. Um, you know, after that, if something fails, there's usually a cause. Um, Mark Boris has got a good uh, comment here. Mark, uh, I'm not sure if you've got, uh, I know you've been on before. If you've got a microphone, then uh, unmute yourself. And uh, let's uh, just a comment about uh, thermo imaging. What, what were you talking about there? Yeah, good morning, guys. Uh, hopefully hey. you're, you're hearing me okay. Get the microphone right. in place here. There you are. Um, you know, something that, that some people don't think about, and of course I understand if you've got hard line going up the tower, you're obviously you're not going to be able to check the joints on the hard line to make sure that you don't have a bullet that's getting hot. But I actually had a bullet burn out on the output of the low pass filter. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not sure why. Um, I just think that uh, maybe um, what we suspected was that the bullet was starting to, it was an older bullet, and we think it, at some point when we had compressing. to shut the transmitter down and we turned the transmitter back on at full power, it, it you know, it just burnt the bullet. So mm -hmm. if you had the means of thermal imaging or, or even just a, an infrared thermometer, check your your hardline joints and to make sure you don't have a bullet that's getting hot. Um, yeah, of course, I could, I could put my hand on this and I know it. that it was it had a problem. Yeah, now good note on uh, thermal imaging too. If you've got something like one of the, the Fluke uh, thermal imagers with the laser pointer on it, um, mm -hmm. get yourself a piece of non-reflective material to, to set your reference because they're not as accurate on reflective stuff. And, and what I use is hockey tape. Um, you can pick up a roll of hockey tape at, uh, well, up here, of course, Canadian Tire for like 79 cents a roll or, or some foolish number. It's just cloth tape. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you um, stick that on the places where you want to uses uh, thermal imaging points or need to take a temperature on a regular basis, whether it's a circuit breaker panel or coax elbows, things like that, then it gives you a reference point that you can always aim the uh, the laser at and uh, get yourself a good, uh, good accurate reading every time. Um, so yeah, that's a, a really good point, Mark. Um, one I of use, the uh, other I things... use gaffer's tapes for that because it's I really common. I was going to say, any kind of yeah. non-reflective tape works fine. Yep. 
gaffer yep, tape yep. because it doesn't leave re residue so you can put it on things that are a little bit more exactly. uh, sensitive to that uh, mm -hmm. the, the, I, I work in transmitter sites I, sensitive is kind of irrelevant <laughs> but, but yeah no it's a really good point any non-reflective uh, tape would mm -hmm. be good um, Paul Meyer makes a good point about uh, checking tension spring hangers because if you uh, have one that's loose or broken, then uh, definitely things are not going to be lined up. And when things aren't lined up, then your center gets closer to your outer, and bad stuff happens. A lot of uh, a lot of low-pass filters I've found that fail is exactly that, where over time they'll sag on one side and it'll break the weld mm -hmm. right where the uh, where the connector is, and that's the bad day because it's still on when that breaks and it, and it kind of drops itself. And it's not right, only yeah. lateral; it's not this way. But it's also mm -hmm. this way. You know, you can't. Now, I'm going to. I, I see him in the audience, and I'm going to just grab him uh, purely spur of the moment because I know he does this sort of thing. But Kirk Harnack, I, I see you're here. So if you're, if if you're not on the phone or on a call at the moment, uh, then uh, feel free to unmute yourself, because uh, I want to uh, talk to you a little bit about something. Uh, you do a lot of drone stuff. I I do some, yeah, indeed. And uh, now, would it be possible to mount some sort? Of, is is there are there drones that can get thermal imaging done to the point where you could check hot spots on a coax or a hard line going up a uh, tower? Absolutely. In fact, uh, Garrison Cavell and uh, Paul Schulens are both uh, pretty expert at this, having done a lot of it, uh, uh, experience with it themselves. I have not put a thermal Im imaging camera on my drone. Um, I'm not sure my drone would hold it very well, but there certainly are drones that will. Um, and in fact, Paul Schulens was recently on uh, both an episode of This Week in Radio Tech and on an episode of the SBE's Web Extra uh, webcast. And in fact, Paul had just gone through a certification class um, for the uh, understanding the proper uh, interpretation of thermal images. Uh, it's actually, you know, there, there, there's some nuance to it. And, um, and, and so, yeah, it's, it, is a, it is valuable. You almost have to have the, a baseline. You got to have a, a, a pictures when everything's operating well, and then be able to go back and compare that when they're not. And you also, it doesn't do much good to do thermal imaging during the middle of the hot afternoon. You uh, you kind of need to do this. Um, I, I think uh, uh, daybreak is a good time. You know, when when uh, it's been things have been cooling all overnight, and any hot spots will uh, tend to be revealed. And not be covered up by um, thermal uh, heating from you know from the sun. Right, that makes sense. A lot of a uh, lot of a lot more contrast at the cooler point of the day. Now keep in mind too, like Alex is in Minnesota and I'm in Canada, so we're thinking hot part of the day. What's that? Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that that was kind of the point, you know, the, the double-edged sword of here in the Midwest this time of year trying to do that. Guess what's a very shiny surface at three in the morning, you know, just before daybreak because of all the frost that's on there and what have you. Um, but he, Kirk's right. Yeah, I mean, to, to say that they're using the same cameras and imaging systems for uh, tower, uh, television, radio, cellular, uh, that they're using now for agriculture uh, to figure out, you know, where, 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 uh, the soil is starting to freeze or what, you know, heating and stuff like that, hot spots of why certain crops aren't doing what they're supposed to be. So yeah, very similar technologies are in play there. That when, That's when doing cool. thermal, uh, thermal imaging, one of the, uh, and even if, if you go to, um, even a Harbor Freight and buy one of those inexpensive thermal imagers, not one that gives you a, a photograph or a picture, but one that you, you point its laser, uh, finder at something and it, it gives you a, a thermal temperature back. Even even those cheap ones, the manual goes into the topic of emissivity. And mm -hmm. uh, this is one of the things that you learn in a certification class is that just about the only surface that gives you an accurate temperature based on thermal imaging is a black body. So mm -hmm. our transmission lines are not black and opaque. You know, they're, they're all reflective. Um, and uh, if, if you just take a thermal imager uh, or a, uh, one of those infrared IR thermometers around your own house, you'll find that you get accurate readings on dark objects, uh, you know, black bodies, um, 
and not as accurate at all on chrome or or anything shiny or even anything light colored. So you right. have to take this into account when doing drone imaging. And that's one of the things that you end up getting certified on. Now, I don't say that to discourage people. I just say that, hey, don't just fly up with a drone or take a picture of something and assume that the readings you're getting are accurate. There are, you know, calibration and um, uh, correction factors based on the emissivity of the object that you're taking the thermal temperature of. Right. And that's one of the points I made, especially for ground based stuff where you, you put some hockey tape just because it's a black mat uh, cloth tape, but but something like that to give you the, the low emissivity. Uh, Kirk, one other thing I want to bring up, you uh, mentioned it very briefly, and I, I'd like to give you a chance to uh, to put a little commercial in for it. But uh, you do a uh, weekly webinar the this week in Radio Tech. Yeah, Thursdays at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern time. If you'll just Google this week in Radio Tech, or the website is this week in Radio Tech, of course, always one word, dot com, uh, you'll find our episodes there. We have a, a YouTube channel where we have most, not all, but most of the uh, past episodes archived. We've been doing the show for coming up on 11 years now. We've got 515 episodes. Our 516th one will be this coming Thursday. Excellent. And, uh, Thank you for that. Yeah. I, I may or may not have been able to show up on that once or twice. So that, <clears throat> hey, uh, on the uh, on the topic of, of uh, things that go boom and bad ideas, I did have a really interesting experience uh, years ago. We had a uh, transmitter site with a two and a half kilowatt uh, transmitter that came out of Quincy, Illinois, and um, you know it blew a lot of air through it. And um, well. The manager, the owner of the station had decided that there were too many cockroaches in the dilapidated trailer that was the transmitter building. And so he uh, went very carefully all around the building uh, with a with a carton of roach proof, uh, P-R-U-F-E, roach proof, and uh, with a teaspoon. And he sprinkled this out all over everywhere. Now, I'm sure there are people who are on this uh, listening in the audience that are smarter than me. Maybe Alex, maybe you, Jeff, know about this. Roach proof contains a chemical that reacts very badly with silver surfaces. And so yep. within a few hours, um, I got a phone call. The, the transmitter was having trouble and uh, went there. And every single silver surface in the transmitter was black, jet black. I'm sure it had mm -hmm. great emissivity at that point. <laughs> If right. I had an, in, an infrared thermometer. So we had to scrub and scrub and scrub and uh, vacuum up all the roach proof we possibly could. And the funny thing is, I, I mean, one of the, the things that we talk about in, in tips all the time uh, for keeping snakes and varmints out of uh, facilities is, is mothballs. Mm -hmm. And I read somewhere, and I, I may be having a brain fart because I can't remember where, but uh, at one point, mothballs had something in them that didn't react well to uh, electronics as well. And I forget whether it's toluene or, or naphtha, but uh, there, there was something that... Uh, you know, maybe somebody in, with a little more chemical knowledge in the audience can uh, shoot an email and uh, it'll end up as a, as a tips and tricks one day. But Kirk, thanks for the comments because that, that was very useful information. I appreciate it. Yeah, good talk to you. See you. Yeah, I, I saw where that story was going really quickly. I'm like, uh oh, I've played this game. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's way too easy. What do they call it? The law of unintended consequences. You yep, try to you do a good thing perfect. and end up doing a bad thing. Yep, exactly. Exactly. So, and, and yeah, the, the in the thermal imaging thing as well, you know, I've had times where even in modern days where you can you have these tools available to you like thermal imaging drones and such like that. And you're having a problem, you know, 300 feet in the air. Um, and it's such a minute heat signature of a problem like you said the inner gets closer to the outer factor but the transmitter just won't stay on you know it, it, it's seeing these arc overs so fast that it's not heating it fast enough because the transmitter is recycling constantly mm -hmm. you know it's like okay so how do you track that problem you know and again that's tools in the war chest you know tdrs or whatever and you can yeah. find those burnt out bullets or uh, bad sections and flanges that are coming loose or Thor getting a hold of you. Mm -hmm. um, those are definite things you can do. Uh, you know, the, I've, I've had it where the drone didn't catch the pinhole in the end of the element, but you know, a guy climbing the tower going up there and looking, he's like, mm, that don't look right. You know, he sends right. you a picture down on a cell phone and it's like, well, there's your problem. 
Yeah. Now, of course, if it's a pressurized line and you're bailing through a couple of tanks of nitrogen a month, then uh, that that's pretty obvious. But uh, right. But yeah, sometimes you and, and the cool thing is things like TDRs that used to be, you know, hugely Tens expensive. Of thousands. And yeah. Just so prohibitive. I mean, now you can get them for a couple of hundred bucks at Harbor Freight. Would I use it as a reference device? No, but to give me an idea where some diagnostic. Is. Absolutely. Yeah. Now you were talking about. I just bought a VNA for $130. Right, right. Uh, you were talking earlier about the, the best intentions, and sometimes you do yeah. things with a good idea, and uh, that kind of leads into this. Right. Uh, this is one of your stories. You sent me this picture, and I kind of mentally stuttered just a little bit. Um, tell me yeah. the story. So I get a phone call saying that the tower doesn't have any AC power, and the station is in the front yard, and the tower's in the backyard. And, uh, you know, uh, just looking at it, and it's, it's a 400 amp AC feeder going from the main building to the tower building. Uh, so it's a pretty, pretty heavy cable uh, and multiples thereof to carry the load. Uh, it was originally designed to have uh, a couple of old tube AMs on it, and now it's a pile of FMs and some cellular. And, uh, you know, we checked the, check the, the breakers and, and the one arm bandit, and we're like, Everything looks okay. Nothing smells bad. Why is there no power here? And of course, a 400 amp uh, panel. You know, I'm not. I'm no electrician. I'm not certified to open a panel. So I had to wait for uh, had to wait for the electrician to show up. You know, it was emergency rate because obviously, well, well. To be fair, it's, when you see snow on the ground and darkness in Minnesota, you, it could be 3:30 in the afternoon or it could be midnight. You don't know. <laughs> but. Uh, you know, we had to call an electrician, say, hey, I need you to come out and check a panel for me, so on and so forth. And as we were walking from down the driveway from the tower to the back to the building, I look over and I see this and they just put in a new driveway out here. So he wanted to mark off where the new driveway was because it was a little longer than the old one. And I see this and I'm like, that's thawed ground. <laughs> In January, in Minnesota. <laughs> That's not normal, and this is in the middle, not on the, not on the, the side where the, where the road is or anything. This is where you know the utilities. And I just sat there and I looked at the owner and I said, "Say, do you know where the power lines come from the main building? What, what path they take to get out here?" And he goes, "Yeah, it starts out here," and he points right to it and stops. <laughs> and the light comes on. And the light comes on. Because thawed ground, when you see soil <laughs> in January, yeah. that is thawed. You know you've I, got a problem. On the plus side, it probably made it a whole lot easier to dig the hole. It took, still took us about three days with the propane heater over the top, but uh, it, it didn't take the normal two weeks to thaw that out, I'll tell yeah. you that much. Now, uh, stepping back to uh, what Kirk had mentioned with the, the roach control, Paul Meyer, while he will not admit to ever having had that problem, suggests boric acid around the perimeter for roaches. And, and I know bor uh, borox, borox, I think that's what it's yeah, called. Yeah, laundry uh, detergent yeah. booster. Yeah, is uh, pretty common around here for ants and uh, smaller, uh, smaller insects. So, no, that's a really good idea. Um, Mark Voris mentions that uh, on the topic of uh, low price uh, VNAs, uh, nano VNA for 60 bucks, and he retuned an LPFM antenna with it. Yep. So, you know, they're certainly the, the tools that we used to spend tens of thousands of dollars on. Well, like infrared if not cameras. Hundreds of thousands. I mean, yeah. You know, the first infrared camera we bought at uh, Nautel came somewhere in the eight to $10,000 range. And I mean, now 200 bucks and it uh, just ties right into my cell phone and bang, you're done. Yep. So Josh, who's wants to know what you think about the cheaper VNAs and you've got firsthand experience. So I'll let you answer that one. Well, I, I have firsthand experience, but not with this new one that I just got. It's still in the box. Haven't had a reason to grab it out yet. Um, but, you know, I've got, you know, some of the, the more inexpensive tools that are out there, you know, like uh, there's things on eBay and AliExpress, like uh, the component testers, they're like four bucks. And, you know, they got three leads on them and you attach whatever device, whether it be a capacitor, resistor, diode, whatever, and it mm -hmm. uses a nine volt battery, you push a button, it'll identify that part for you. You know yeah. what, for $9, that is worth keeping in the tool chest, because you don't know what you're staring at. 
um, very handy for that kind of stuff. The VNAs, I, I've used, um, you know, I, uh, Regal was a, a newcomer when I bought my Spectrum Analyzer. You know, I was paying less than $2,000 for a Spectrum Analyzer. Everybody thought I was nuts <laughs> with a tracking generator. And I'm like, it's what I can afford, you know, at the time. And it has proven itself time and time again to be very reliable. Um, right. You know, things like that, uh, you know, the, the power aims uh, are a very expensive tool to have, but they're necessary mm -hmm. for guys who do, do AM work. I have an AIM UH, UHF. It was the cheaper you, model, but works just the same. Yeah, if you do any, um, any uh, having a brain fart, if you do any component level repair, an ESR meter is a really, really useful tool, especially yep. if you're working with stuff like caps and inductors. Yep. Um, Josh mentioned that he's got a Siglent VNA that he's had a lot of luck with. So Siglent, S-I-G-L-E-N-T, if anybody's looking for a shiny new piece of test gear, yep, there's a recommendation for you. The the uh, the only tip and trick I will give you on these more inexpensive tools, like the cheaper, you know, the $100 VNAs, is they do come with SMAs. Uh, so be prepared to spend, you know, a few more bucks on a good set of adapter cables and, you know, being able to characterize them and being able to make sure that, you know, take those out of the equation or adapt them to a connector that you're used to, like N or DIN. Yeah, one other note about those two is, I mean, it is a $100 piece of test gear, so it's going to last about as long as a $100 piece of test gear. You know, if you're trying to use it every single day, then you maybe invest in something a little bigger, but for occasional use, if you got to tune an antenna here or there, or just need something in the, the toolbox for the occasional verification, you, right. you can't and that's be. kind of what these are for, for me is, you know, it gives me an idea into what may be the bigger problem. You know, yeah. if you're doing things like these kinds of tests, and then if you have to go and rent uh, the, the, the big Rodian Schwartz or, or sig, uh, you know, s signal hounds and stuff like that to get deeper dives. At least you know where to start without spending the money up front. That's what right. I use. Them right. for. Exactly. But, you know, the case of the power thing, that is definitely a hard one to say. Could I have prevented that? Maybe. Well, it's hard to yes. say. <laughs> yes and no. I mean, number one, it's a good idea around your facilities to have the any underground conductor location marked, mm -hmm. um, you know, and beyond that, not only should you know where the underground conductors are, you need to know how deep they are. Well, that you was know. just it is these have worked them, you know, the erosion here worked the lines, the, the, the top came real close to where mm -hmm. it, it was less than, I want to say it was only about 18 inches down yeah. when they buried yeah. it, when the place was built in the sixties, it was several it was feet. Probably, I'm going to say probably below the frost line at that point. Yeah. But the standard freezing and thawing heaves above it will will tend to move things up. Mm -hmm. So definitely, at the very least, knowing where they are lets you know that you may want to use a little care and caution before you drive some drive a rod here. I'm, yep. I mean, and when I know we dug this back up, we put an aluminum plate over it right there. Yep. So if you pound another snow stake in, you hear metal, you you know where you found it. Yeah, and that's one of the things that a lot of folks do, either put a barrier atop it, or um, if you're running underground cable, maybe put uh, concrete, uh, you can use concrete building blocks as a, a layer over top, just something to slow you down. Because I know we've all, but but number one, having the location mark, we've all heard the stories about somebody coming out to uh, put in a satellite feed base and uh, cutting through a, a coax or a fiber cable. You know, backhoe like fade is, said, is a thing. Like you said, you know, if you get lost in the woods, just lay the piece of fiber out and the backhoe will be there in 20 minutes to take you home. Yep, you yep, know, exactly. Doesn't work well, with AC lines, it, however. I was going to say, it'll be there to cut the fiber. The ride home is just a side benefit, but yeah, exactly. Right. So on that note, we're at the top of the hour, according to the clock above my head and the one on my wrist. So mandatory links to all of the resources. We do record these webinars and you can get to them through the uh, resources tab on our website. Uh, we've also got an events tab for signing up and I think that's uh, also a, a link to stuff like that. Uh, we've got the newsletters. Uh, there's a, the Waves Art newsletter. I think there's another one coming up in a couple of weeks. I think Fiona's chasing me for some stuff. 
and definitely our YouTube channel. We had a good discussion this morning before we opened up and Alex came up with a good idea. So we're talking about putting up a playlist just for the, uh, the TTT, these uh, Tuesday sessions. So, you know, if you think that's a great idea, let us know. If you think it's the stupidest idea you ever heard, well, don't bother letting us know because we're going to do it anyway. But uh, no, let us know that too. You know, it's always useful. So folks, on that note, Alex, I want to thank you very much for joining me. Uh, it's okay. kind of cool to talk about blowing stuff up without actually blowing anything up. Yeah, give me. it's still early in the week. Give me a chance. It's still early in the day. Um, <laughs> That's but, true. On that folks note, uh, next week, we're going to talk about the 100th anniversary of radio. We've got a few special guests. This should be a whole lot of fun. So on that note, thank you very much for your time. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Have a great day. Bye now. Bye-bye.